This is the city, Los Angeles, California. It's a big place and getting bigger all the time. 20 years ago, this was our telephone book. Today, it takes these five books to do the same job. People move here from all over the country looking for a new life. Some leave their inhibitions back where they came from. And sometimes their sense of right and wrong. That's when I go to work. I carry a bag. It was Wednesday, March 19th. It was cold in Los Angeles. We were working the day watch out of juvenile division. The boss is Captain Lou Ritchie. My partner's Bill Gannon. My name's Friday. Bill and I had just returned from court where we had testified in a juvenile narcotics case. We were on our way to lunch when the captain stopped us in the hallway. The story you are about to see is true. The names have been changed to protect the innocent. Good to see you. As you know, John's OIC juvenile unit, West Valley. Yeah, we know. How'd it go in court? Looked like he had a good case. We got a petition sustained. Six months probation, custody of his parents. How do you figure it, Captain? Kid's an addict, in possession, was even selling the stuff. I don't know. 16 years old. Pearson's got an epidemic on his hands out in West Valley. Friday, you remember the way it was in 57? Four radio units covered the entire division? Yeah, John. Things have changed a lot since then. About 130,000 more people have moved in. How many more men did you get? Not enough. Here are the statistics, Joe. John's division covers about 85 square miles, eight different communities. At the last count, 330,000 people. Half of them, 150,000, are juveniles. That's more people than the entire population of Savannah, Georgia. And I've got just 10 officers to handle them. It's getting out of hand. First two months of last year, we arrested 489 kids. First two months of this year, we arrested 596. What's your biggest problem, Pearson? All of them. Narcotics, grand theft auto, drinking, shoplifting. We got them all. It's not just a problem of law enforcement. It's a community problem. The trouble is there's no community, Captain. These people come piling in here from everywhere. They don't know each other and don't want to. They come out here, make a down payment on the house, and move in with a couple of kids. That doesn't mean they made a home. No more than giving a name to a place makes it a community. Yeah, and you get a little weary of hearing every kid give you the same excuse when you tag them. You don't understand. I just want to belong. That's why I did it. Belong to what? What it boils down to is the new morality, doesn't it? A whole new sense of values. The kids see it on television, in magazines, even hear it from the pulpit. God is dead. Drug addiction is mind expanding. Promiscuity is glamorous. Even homosexuality is praiseworthy. How are you going to fight that? It ain't easy. But you got to remember that the vast majority of the juveniles you're handling are the kids next door. They're not hardcore criminals. It's just that for them, it's a great deal more important to be accepted by the other kids than to please their parents. Maybe if you put a couple of men on the lecture circuit, talk to the schools, the PTAs. I got 104 schools, Captain. I got 10 men. You got 12 now. p.m. To help out Sergeant Pearson, the captain assigned us to temporary duty in the West Valley Division. After we filed our reports, we drove out to Reseda. It's a good 35-minute drive from downtown, even on the freeway. 3.20 p.m. Bill and I checked into West Valley Juvenile. Yeah, okay, you hold him there. We'll be right over. Shoplifter, Summers Department Store, West Valley Plaza. They're holding him in the security office. Right. 15-year-old boy. p.m., we headed for the West Valley Plaza, an old established shopping center. Summer's department store is one of the largest in California. It has branches in almost every part of the city. 3.45 p.m. Al Rost. Friday and Gannon, West Valley Jewel. I got the boy in the next office. Here's the theft report. I'm getting writers for making these out. It's like the locusts have moved in. Last month or so, we've had pretty big losses. That's right. We've been taken for almost $4,000 worth of merchandise. Same thing's happening to other stores here in the plaza. Young kids take weird stuff, like they want in the next office. One whirlwind hair dryer, 1698. One package deep soft diapers, 268. One box paper clips, 42 cents. What's a 15 year old kid want with stuff like that? Let's ask him. You the 
fudge? Police officers, what's your name, son? Bobby Lassen. He asked me that already. All right, Bob, you're under arrest. It's our duty to advise you of your rights. You have the right to remain silent, and any statements you make may be used against you in a court of law. You have the right to the presence of an attorney. If you desire and cannot afford an attorney, one will be appointed before any questioning. Now, do you understand that? Yeah. You live at 20329 Terrigen Place, Canoga Park? Yeah, that's where I live. How old are you? 15. Be 16 in August. You gonna call my mother? That's right. We have to take you into the office first. You gonna put me in jail? Maybe. What for? I didn't do nothing. You stole merchandise from this store. Well, you got it all back, didn't you? Nobody got hurt. You did, son. You committed a crime. Uh, even if I'd gotten away with it, they'd never miss it. They got all the stuff in the world. Why'd you take these things? A hairdryer, diapers, paper clips? I had to. You had to. Well, sure, it adds up to 20 bucks, doesn't it? Five p.m. With the subject in custody, we return to the office. 4.15 p.m. I call Georgia Juvenile Records and the Central Juvenile Index in the L.A. Sheriff's Office. Robert Lassen had no previous record. Following department procedure, I filled in Sergeant Pearson. Let's get the parents down there, Joe. Find out what his background is. Maybe we can straighten him up without going to court. Okay, John. Joe? He wants a favor before his mother gets here. Yeah. Wants to call a friend of his, claims he left a package in a service station a couple of blocks from school, wants somebody to pick it up and bring it here. What's in it? Something about his clothes. I can't let her see me in these. She'll kill me. Doesn't your mother know you dress like that? Well, if she did, would I have to change clothes in a gas station every day? Where'd you get that outfit? I bought it. You sure about that? You gonna let me change? No. Boy, my mother's really gonna be mad. I hope so. <laughs> 4.26 p.m., I called the Lassen boy's mother and explained the circumstances of his arrest. She said it would take about 15 to 20 minutes to drive over. Are you Sergeant Friday? Yes, ma'am, that's right. I'm Peggy Lassen, Bobby's mother. Sorry it took me so long to get here. I had to get a babysitter. I understand. I'm sorry we had to ask you to come over. Would you like to sit down, please? Is Bobby here? Yes, ma'am. He's just inside. He's all right. May I see him? Yes, I'd like to ask you a few questions first. You're going to put him in jail? Well, that depends, Mrs. Lassen. Has the boy ever been in trouble before? No, never. He didn't do anything really wrong, did he? Well, like I told you on the telephone, ma'am, he was arrested for shoplifting. You know, boys take things sometimes. Like a baseball or jackknife, things like that. It's stealing, Mrs. Lassen. He's been wanting a pocket knife. Is that what he took? I'll pay for it. No, ma'am. He took a hair dryer, a dozen diapers, and a box of paper clips. Now, do you know any reason why he'd want those things? No. Do you think maybe he might have taken them to give to somebody as a present? He was never in any trouble before. It's like living in a big vacuum out here. Do you know that? Back home, we used to have friends, neighbors. Out here, all we have are people who happen to live next door. We've lived in the same house for two years, and we still don't know anybody. Not really. Not like it was back home. Nobody's got any roots out here. My husband says it was like being in the army. The first thing you ask somebody is where they're from. You know what I mean? Nobody belongs to anybody or anything. We're all strangers. It makes it difficult, you know? What's that, Miss Lassen? Raising a family. Bobby makes friends in school. I never get to meet their parents. He used to bring his friends home sometimes. They were nice boys, mostly. Do you know who he runs around with? Not anymore. He comes home for dinner and... And he does his homework and he goes right out again. But he, he's always in bed by 10 o'clock on school nights. His father sees to that. Do you think your husband will straighten him out? Have a talk with him? He's going to get whipped all right, if that's what you mean. Nobody in our family has ever been arrested. My husband's not going to like it. You're not going to put him in jail? No, ma'am. You can take him home this time. But if he gets in trouble again, it'll go a little harder for him. Thank you. I'll get the boy. Hi, Ma. Where'd you get those clothes? All the guys wear them. I asked you where you got them. From the store. Did you steal them? 
You wouldn't let me buy them. If father sees you dressed up like that, he'll have a fit. Will you tell me what's so wrong with these clothes? Why can't I ever be like the other kids? Their parents let them. Well, I'm not their mother. I'm yours. And no son of mine is going to dress up like a circus clown. Well, all the other kids do. Did they steal them? Well, so what if they did? You took those things without paying for them. You stole them, didn't you? Well, I had to, Mom. Don't you understand? I can't be in the club if I don't. You didn't tell us about any club, son. Tell us about it now. Well, they call it the Mod Squad. To get in, you gotta steal $20 worth of stuff. Why didn't you come to me? I could have found the $20 for you somewhere. It's not the money. You know the little tags they put on stuff? It has the price on it. What about them? Well, if you buy something, they, they tear it in half. But to get in the Mod Squad, you gotta bring the whole tag. If you buy it, they won't give you the whole tag. I asked them. And if you don't have the whole one, Adi won't let you join. And it's got to add up to $20. That's why I took that junk. Who's Audie? The top man. He says who gets in and who don't. What's his last name? Fulton. Audie Fulton. You know the names of the rest of this bunch? Do I have to tell him? Yes, you do. I don't want to be a fink. Let's have the name, son. Well, they'll never let me join the club now. Well, now, don't let it worry you. What do you mean? I got a hunch their membership drive's going to be over. Thursday, March 20th, 8.30 a.m. Before we released him into the custody of his mother, we made the Lassen boy change his clothes that he had stolen and held them as evidence. He gave us the names of the members of the Mod Squad, one of the teenage groups that was partly responsible for the current wave of shoplifting in the valley. They were all students at the Millard Senior High School. Bill called the boys' vice principal. He said he could arrange for us to talk with the boys. 8.42 a.m. Millard High is one of eight senior high schools in the West Valley. It took us about 10 minutes to get there. We met David Carroll, the boys' vice principal, in his office. We gave him the list of names we had gotten from the Lassen boy. The Mod Squad. As we understand, supposed to steal $20 worth of merchandise in order to belong. Is that correct? I'm afraid so. We have another group called the Tiger Tankers. I understand to get into that one, the boys have to steal a car. That's right, Mr. Carroll. They're under investigation now. We have two of their members in custody. Are they my boys? No, sir. Well, they call them clubs. Most of them are really just gangs. We have a lot of good organizations, honor societies, things like that. We try to encourage those, discourage the other ones, the gangs. We have rules against them. We try, but we can't stop them. Oh, I don't know. Maybe they need them. How do you mean, Mr. Carroll? Well, belonging to a club or a gang gives them a sense of security, a sense of belonging somewhere. It gives them something they don't get at home. Things we all need. Love and affection, security, recognition, new adventure. Now, they don't get those things at home. They're going to look for them somewhere else. In the Mod Squad, maybe, or, or the Hell's Angels. Instead of something worthwhile like the Boy Scouts or the YMCA. And most times, it's a reasonable substitute. When they go bad, there's nothing much we can do about it. We have 3,000 boys and girls here. We only have so much time. We try, but we can't do the parents' job for them. We only have them six or seven hours a day. The best we can do is to try to give them an education. They're supposed to learn the basic values at home. I didn't mean to deliver a speech. I'll go get the boys for you. You really think talking to them is going to do any good? We never know, but we try it. I don't know. Looks to me like you're doing them a favor. How's that, Mr. Carroll? Getting them out of class. Nine fifteen a.m. We assembled the members of the Mod Squad. We told them that we knew groups like theirs were involved in the wave of shoplifting that had hit the valley. Oh, pardon me, Mr. Policeman. Fuzz, sir. May I ask a question? Audie Fulton, isn't it? The one and only. It shows. Are you gonna bust us or just bore us to death? I mean, man, you're interrupting our education. How are we ever going to go up to fight wars and pay taxes if cops keep playing games with us? They tell me you're the top man here, is that so? Some say that. You the one that makes up the rules, decides who's in, who's out, how much you have to steal for the privilege of joining? Uh, no, man, we're democratic. This is America, we put it to a vote. And they elected you? Sure. I got dominant genes, man, I'm a natural-born leader. You're also a natural-born thief. And that's for you to prove, baby. That's your bag, not mine. Don't push your luck, boy. It just might happen. And if we do, that grin will leave your face in a big hurry, fella. Don't think you've come up with a new wrinkle here. There's nothing new about being a thief. The state prison's full of them. Let me tell you about one of them. 
First time I met him, he was 16, just about your age. His name was Jim. He went to school in North Hollywood. We picked him up for shoplifting. We talked to his parents, seemed like a nice family, so we let him go. A couple of months later, we picked him up again. He was at the wheel of a stolen car. This time he went to court. They put him on probation. Looked like he was going to straighten up. He didn't. A couple of weeks later, the owner of a liquor store picked him out of a show-up. He'd held up the store with a 22 rifle his father had given him for his birthday. I didn't see much of him after that. That was eight years ago. But I know he put in two years with the California Youth Authority. He got out and went home. His buddies from high school were all in the Army, married or thinking about getting married. And they didn't want to have much to do with him. Honest people don't like to be around thieves. The only people who'd associate with him were other thieves. And when thieves get together, they only got one thing in mind, to steal something from somebody. They tried their hand at holding up a supermarket. They didn't make it. But they did manage to kill the manager. Jim's up at San Quentin now. He's 25. He spent one-third of his life in jail. It's doubtful he'll reach his 26th birthday. His lawyers are trying to get the sentence commuted to life, but right now he's scheduled for the gas chamber on September 8th. Ten years ago, I told him what I'm telling you. When you live in a society, you either live by the rules or by democratic process, you change them. You don't break them. Joe. Kind of makes you wonder, doesn't it? About what? It's like we were living in a different century. We see things as black or white, legal or illegal, right or wrong. They don't seem to see it that way. Maybe they just don't know the difference. Then it's time they learn. Nine fifty-six a.m. We drove back to West Valley Juvenile. 12, 10 p.m. In just over two hours, we were able to contact most of the parents. We ran the names of the members of the Mod Squad through juvenile records and the Sheriff's Central Juvenile Index. None of them had any previous record. With the parents alerted, there was a good chance it might stay that way. Joe, Bill, got another one for you. A shoplifter. Summer's department store again. Yeah. Kid named Audie Fulton. Twelve twenty-two p.m. Upon arrival at Summers Department Store, we went immediately to the security office. Hal Roston again met us. Take a look at this. One can of hairspray, one bottle of cologne, three lipsticks, six spools of thread, one transistor radio, six handkerchiefs, one pair of pinking shears, six shoestrings, two combs, one nail tweezers. How do you expect to haul all this stuff away? With ingenuity. We meet again. I'll go quietly. No more speeches, please. You're under arrest, son. It's our duty to advise you. Yeah, I learned that in government, too. I have the right to remain silent, and any statement I make may be used against me in a court of law. I have the right to the presence of an attorney. If I can't afford one, one will be appointed before any questioning. Now, how about that? Do you understand it? Sure. Name, rank, and serial number, baby. That's all you're getting from me. Geneva Conventions. I guess we didn't get through to you, did we, boy? I offered to pay for the stuff. He's got a charge account here. He showed me his card after I picked him up outside. Why didn't you use it? Oh, that'd be cheating. Is that right? Hey, look, I'm president of the Mod Squad, man. Some of the guys didn't think I'd do it. Said we'd better break up, what with the heat on and everything. But I told them it didn't make any difference. First time the old magic coat has failed me. This it? And neat, huh? Designed it myself. You can put a lot of jazz in there. Now look, uh, why don't I just pay for this stuff? Nobody gets hurt, we forget the whole thing. Can't do that, son. Why not? That'd be cheating. Twelve forty-nine p.m. With the boy in custody, we returned to the office. One o five p.m. While Bill took the boy into the office to complete the arrest report, I filled in Sergeant Pearson. May have to file a petition on this one, Joe. See if you can get hold of his parents. That may be a little difficult. How's that? On the way over, he said he hadn't seen him in three days. One forty-five p.m. I called the Fulton residence. A maid answered. She said Mr. Fulton was out of town and that Mrs. Fulton wasn't taking any calls. I asked her if she was at home. The maid said she was. 2.08 p.m., Bill and I left the office and drove over to the Fulton home. It was located in the Royal Oak section of Woodland Hills, a high-income section of the valley. Yes, Janet? What is this? Police officers, Mrs. Fulton. 
This is Bill Gannon. My name's Friday. We called earlier. Oh, yes, Janet told me. It's about Audie, isn't it? Well, I'm sure there's a very big mistake. Do you know about his connection with a gang called the Mod Squad? You mean those boys in the English costumes? Well, that's Audie's club. They come up here on weekends, and we let them have the house for their meetings. Do you or your husband supervise them, ma'am? Well, not at Audie's age. He's a big boy now. You always leave the liquor out like that, ma'am? Well, of course. Why shouldn't we? Well, there have been several reports of teenage drinking going on in this area. Now, we're not accusing you, but it might be a good idea to keep your liquor locked up unless you or your husband are here to supervise your son's parties. Really? I hadn't heard about that. We'd like you to come down to the office and talk to your son. Well, what on earth for? He's under arrest, Mrs. Fulton. Now, what could he have done? He's only 16. He walked out of Summer's department store with about $75 worth of merchandise he didn't pay for. Well, that's silly. We have a charge account there. Yes, ma'am. He told us. Well, then that's it, isn't it? I mean, just send the bill and we'll be happy to pay for whatever he took. It's too late for that, Mrs. Fulton. He went in with the intent to shoplift. That makes it burglary. That's a felony. Well, now, why would he do something like that? We give him anything he wants. There's no reason for him to steal. He has everything, everything he needs. Does he? Two twenty-three p.m. We return to West Valley Juvenile. Mrs. Fulton said she'd follow us in her own car. Two thirty-six p.m. Officer John Finley brought Mrs. Fulton into the office. I parked right in front. That's all right, isn't it? I mean, I won't get a ticket or anything. No, ma'am. Would you like to sit down? How long is this going to take? Only as long as it takes to make a decision. What do you mean? We have to make a choice, Mrs. Fulton. We can end it right here, let him walk out, or we can detain him and file an application for a petition with the county probation department. Well, what happens if you file this a petition thing? There'll be a hearing in juvenile court. You mean you'll put him in jail? That'll be up to the probation department. They can decide to release him or take him to court to stand trial. Oh, how long does all that take? If he has to go to court, it'll be about five days for adjudication, about 12 more for disposition. Well, if that happens, do I have to go to court with him? Yes, ma'am. You and your husband. Oh. Is there any way things could be speeded up? How do you mean? My husband and I are leaving for Europe March 30th. Yes, ma'am. Do you plan on taking the boy along? No. It's going to be sort of a second honeymoon, Sergeant. I see. You tell him about you and Dad going to Europe? There you are, Audie. Are you all right? It's fine. You tell him why you're not taking me along? Now, darling, we discussed all that, didn't we? I didn't. My vote didn't count. Now, Audie, I'm sure these policemen are not interested in our private family matters. What have you decided, Sergeant? Does he stay or do I take him home? He stays. I see. Then you won't be needing me anymore at the moment. No, ma'am. Now, Audie, you must learn. You know you've done wrong, and your father's not going to like this. Why? I'm not even going to dignify that with an answer. And I must run. I'm late now. Yes, ma'am. About 16 years. Thanks. For what, son? For trying to understand. How about you? Are you going to try? Yes, sir, I'm going to try. No matter how this turns out, I don't want to see your name on the books again. You won't. I understand now. That's where we differ. How do you mean? I never will. The story you have just seen is true. The names were changed to protect the innocent. On April 3rd, an adjudication hearing was held in the Juvenile Court, Superior Court of the State of California for the County of Los Angeles. In a moment, the results of that hearing. A petition filed by the County Probation Department was sustained, and the subject was made a ward of the Juvenile Court.